Thanks for having me out. This is, this is a really awesome event. It's actually pretty incredible to see us uh, be able to, to get together uh, again and do stuff like this. I live in California, so it's probably been like this for the last two years in Florida. But uh, so I'm not used to it, but this is, this is awesome. And uh, it's really cool to see some familiar faces, people I deployed with that I'm just running into here and uh, uh, people I haven't seen in years, people I saw last week. Um, but it's a strong community, as we know, a lot of us uh, in here. And, and if you're new to this, uh, to this community of, of athletes, of, of veterans, of just all around badasses, uh, it's, it's a good one to be a part of because you're, you're never uh, the studliest person in the room. And so you're always, you're always learning from somebody. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, 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 and thanks Jason for having me out, uh, and, and, and go rock. What a cu cool, uh, uh, company organization. Um, I'm excited to, to hit that challenge tomorrow, uh, and get my ass kicked. Uh, that's, that's why I'm here. Um, but that's what it's all about for me. And, uh, and thank you for, to, uh, F45, uh, for having me out as well. Um, you know, be sure to check those guys out. Uh, pretty special stuff we'll be working on in the future here moving forward. Um, you know, as for me, I, I uh, you know, talking about your why, finding your why, or, or, or as many people call it, you know, your purpose. Um, uh, that's something that I have chased for most of my life, probably, well, definitely all of my adult life, bless you. Um, but uh, most of my life generally, I mean, I was a big dreamer as a kid, like daydreamer when I say dreamer. We all have dreams, but like I, I, I was to the point, um, and I'm still to this point at the age of 41, uh, but I remember you know, growing up and just like being the biggest sports fan in the world, getting so excited uh, to watch games, watch these athletes that I that I look up to that like I couldn't even sit still. I, I'd be I'd be I'd be probably seven years old watching an entire baseball game, regular season game, you know, first pitch to last pitch, just glued to the TV and then on commercial breaks like I'm walking around the room, like flapping my hands because I'm so excited and I don't even like realize I'm doing it. Um, just, just an out there sports uh, nut and always wanted to be a professional athlete since I was a little kid. It was something that just, I mean, a lot of, a lot of kids have that dream to be fair. Uh, but it was like, man, I, I just know somehow someday it's going to happen in some way. Um, and, and that never really went away. I, I, uh, I, I definitely felt the dream fade a bit as I got to high school and I was a late bloomer, I was pretty small, wasn't the fastest kid or the strongest kid or the toughest kid, certainly not the smartest kid. Um, but no, you know, I'd always get like the coaches award for hustle or whatever. And, uh, you know, be on the, be on like the second and third team all league, like almost, almost good, almost good enough to, you know, get legitimate looks from colleges or whatever, but never really that guy. And, uh, and that's all right. I mean, looking back on it, man, I, I probably exceeded my athletic ability by quite a bit just because I was such a dreamer and I just believed in this possibility of, you know, of, 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 of greatness that I thought I was destined for. And, uh, you know, I, I, I graduated high school. Uh, like I said, the only thing on my mind, and even at then at 18 was like, I want to be a pro athlete. Um, no, no scholarship offers for, for baseball and basketball, which are the two sports I played in high school. Um, football was always my favorite sport. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, the, the 49ers were a dynasty when I was a kid. So, you know, growing up, it was Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, Ronnie Lott. Uh, they won five Super Bowls by the time I was 13 years old, you know. So I was really lucky as a fan, you know, as a kid to have that. Um, but I never played. And, and I just, it, I regretted it. Uh, when I was real young, my mom didn't want me to play. My dad played football and wrestled. And, you know, she, she sort of ushered me away from that. He had some injuries and whatnot. And, um, you know, I, I guess I don't blame her for that, but, uh, by the time I was 13 years old, you know, in middle school, and I could have probably played football if I wanted at that point, I was, you know, too afraid of getting cut or riding the bench, you know, too embarrassed and worried about what everybody else thought that I just didn't do it. I didn't even try. And I regretted it for a long time. I regretted it for years. Um, didn't really talk about that to anybody because it seemed like such a petty thing. Like, oh, you didn't play football, you poor guy. You know, there's people in the world that have way, way less than you. Um, but it, it did legitimately bother me because it was, it, was a, it was basically a choice I made to not even attempt. It wasn't even quitting. I didn't even try. Um, and that stuck with me for, for, for a long time. And uh, after high school, I moved down to San Diego. I uh, worked on a fishing boat for a little while. 
uh, did all kinds of different odd jobs, just trying to, you know, make my own way. I, I, I didn't want to go to school uh, at that time in my life because I had no idea what I was even into besides sports, you know, what I even wanted to pursue. And so I was like, you know what, I'm not going to pursue anything uh, wholeheartedly. I'm going to go do things. I'm going to go try things and maybe something will come to me. But, you know, I, I just, I didn't, I, I was sort of rudderless, you know, I, did, I didn't have a, a real strong sense of a, a defined direction anyway. Um, but I had a lot of passion. I definitely was never uh, short on that. Um, and, and, you know, I was fortunate to have two parents that worked really, really hard, you know, first ones to go to college in their families and get graduate degrees. And my mom got her PhD uh, in, in uh, engineering. And uh, at the time, you know, for her, she was a, she was a woman in like a very male dominated field. And, you know, my dad, uh, he's a racehorse veterinarian. He got his veterinary degree um, at the University of Tennessee where I was born. And like, they just both independently worked very, very hard and they still do to this day. Uh, so I, I, I was fortunate to have that upbringing, you know, have that example, I guess. Um, did I live up to it right away? No, but uh, I, I remembered that, you know, and I had that, I had that with me and instilled in me. So I, uh, after a year in San Diego, I move up to Los Angeles and I'm interested in film and television. I have no idea what I'm going to do in this industry, but like all of a sudden it's something that's interesting to me, storytelling. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm essentially just living my best life, quote unquote, at 19, 20 years old. Um, and then 9-11 happens and it completely changed all of our lives. Uh, but for me, I'll speak on, you know, my experience alone. It, uh, it, it like shocked me to my core and kind of woke me up, I think. Um, I didn't join the military right away, but I started, uh, I started traveling. I would save my money up and I would I would go somewhere in an austere environment, some part of the world that I knew nothing about and just sort of explore and try to learn and, and understand, uh, you know, a culture that's different than mine and, and just try to figure out, like, how, how would something like that happen in our world? How could something like that happen in our world? Those travels eventually took me to the Darfur, which is on the, uh, the western border of Sudan. And I went there in the midst of a, a genocide. Uh, I went there to volunteer. Um, I, I, I'd read about this, this tragedy that was going on, uh, where 300,000 people had been killed already. Um, most of the women and children were filling these refugee camps and they were not staffed enough to, to be able to keep up and they were short on everything. And all the men were, were either killed or off fighting and, you know, I, they just needed help. And so I called every NGO like Doctors Without Borders. Catholic Relief Services, Child Fund, and all of them just said, we appreciate you reaching out, but, you know, you don't have a college degree or any special skills. Like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, does all that require a degree to, like, just to help people, to, to build campsites, to, uh, you know, help transport, to assist in medical centers? Like, I, I mean, I understand some of that, yeah, probably, but I'm willing to do anything, and I'll fly myself over there. Like, just let me help. And they all said no. Um, and I guess I understand more of that now after serving in the military, but at the time I didn't get it. I was like, well, I'm just going to go anyway. So I bought a plane ticket and just flew to Africa and figured it out when I got on the ground, essentially. And uh, that's, a, that's a long story in itself, but um, it was essentially sort of my, my first special forces mission uh, where I just was like, all right, I know this is the objective. This is the end state. This is what I want to accomplish. I have no idea how to get to Z right now, but I know how to get to B and I have an idea about C and D and I'll just kind of figure it out as I go. And I did. And, and, you know, I was 22 years old, um, or 23 years old, I guess at the time when I went there and, uh, man, that just the amount of confidence I built from that experience, just going over there and making it happen, just figuring it out, you know, just being, <laughs> being boots on the ground, really. Uh, it just gave me this belief in myself that I could do literally anything. And, and it was sort of a sudden feeling, not to mention the 60 days I spent there and felt purposeful for the first time in my life. Like I was really making a difference for somebody else. Uh, like I was necessary, an essential worker, I guess, uh, would be a good phrase to use today. 
I really felt that um, for the first time in my life, and that was incredible. And and it it made me feel like, man, I have to be a person of service in some way for the rest of my life. And uh, my last week there in country, I got malaria, and I was uh, I was really bad. I mean, I've gotten I've gotten COVID a couple of times. This was this was way worse, <laughs> and COVID sucks. Uh, but this was like. Yeah, I'll leave the details out. You get it. It's bad. Um, and the family that put me up, who, I mean, they had nothing. They lived in this mud compound. They would not take a dollar from me. They're like, no, 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 no. You're, you're a guest in our country. You're a guest in our home. Just please let us take care of you. They put me up. They nursed me back to health. They stuck this little radio in the, next to the cot in the room I was in. And the only station that came through was uh, BBC Network. So I'm listening to the second battle of Fallujah, like the play-by-play as I'm laying in this cot. And I'm inspired by these brave Marines that were the main effort in that battle that, you know, over there fighting for those that can't fight for themselves. And I was like, man, that's, that's the next step. That's what I'm doing. Um, so I, I came back to the States. I went to the Marine recruiter, had a terrible experience, went across the street to the Army recruiter, <laughs> found out about uh, found out about the, the, the Green Berets and uh, the motto, De Oppresso Liber, which means to, to free the oppressed, just really spoke to me like nothing else had. Um, and I just signed up. and like, that's what I'm going to do. That's who I'm going to be. And uh, roughly two years later, I, you know, I, er- I earned my Green Beret and had the opportunity to serve in that unit and, you know, and deploy. I went to Iraq and eventually to Afghanistan as well a couple of times. And um, in- incredible. I mean, that's... Uh, that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother chapter or segment too. Um, but, but obviously I'm proud to be a part of that unit. I'm part, proud to be a part of the, the military brotherhood in general, the veteran community. Um, it means a lot to me. It means a lot to me. And, you know, feeling that, feeling that, that purposefulness, uh, everything being about the man or the woman on your left and right, you know, not about you. It's like, it's about them. It's about keeping them alive, keeping them safe. And that fulfills you, you know? And knowing that they got your back, too, is a pretty, pretty special and incredible thing. And, and it's hard to replicate as we move forward in life. Um, when I was 29 years old, uh, I was finishing up a deployment in Iraq, and I, I made the decision uh, to transition out of, off of active duty into the National Guard and to finally go to college. And I chose the University of Texas because, you know, at the time, we haven't been great recently, but at the time, they were the best. You know, and the Longhorn logo was, like, everywhere on that deployment. There's more Texas fans, uh, at least in the army than, than any other, uh, college I would say. And I was like, that's the team I'm going to go play for. I'm going to, I'm going to go play football. You know, why not? I'm going to go try anyway. So I transitioned out, uh, applied to, to UT, um, wrote a really good, I, I didn't have great grades, but I wrote a really good letter, you know, and, uh, you got to leverage your story, man. You gotta, uh, <laughs> and I got in and I got in and I, and I went out to school I remember I, I, I actually turned 29, so I was 28 when I was in Iraq. I actually turned 29 um, the, day bef- the day before I turned 29 was the first day of school. Then it was my birthday. Then the next day after that was the first day of tryouts. And this is in 2010, you know, and I go out there. and I mean, I'm going 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction, but I'm going as hard as I can on every drill. Like, I remember being in the locker room watching these, I mean, I'll say kids because they were 18 to 22 years old like put their pads on first before I put mine on. Cause I don't want to like put them on backwards or do something stupid. So I'm like literally watching them do this. And, um, but I was excited, man. I was so excited to, to have that, that chance, you know, have that opportunity. And, uh, you know, I made the team didn't play a snap the first year. Um, but I started long snapping. I wanted to find a way on the field. Didn't matter to me. Like I'll do the thankless job that nobody wants to do. Um, and long snapping is absolutely that job. Like nobody cares about the long snapper until he screws up and then you are the bad guy forever. So, uh, so now that's not a very sought after position, but it was perfect for me. Like I'm, I'm not the most athletic person, but I'm going to focus on that thing and I'm going to figure it out. So, you know, I, 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 I earned that job one that won the starting spot started for three years, uh, actually went back to Afghanistan a couple of times while I was in school, uh, over the summer. Uh, which was, I volunteered for that. I wanted to do that. Um, hopefully giving somebody a break over there by, by, by doing, doing that job, you know, somebody that maybe had a family and, and, uh, I was, I was more than willing to take a little summer vacation to Afghanistan. It's very humid in Austin in the summer. So, you know, you want to get out of the, you want to get, it's a dry heat 
in uh, Afghanistan. But uh, so, you know, finished up college, uh, had uh, an opportunity at the next level, you know, and uh, didn't last very long. I, I know I was the oldest rookie in NFL history, but I also had the shortest career in NFL history, and that's all right. Um, but I got, I got signed as a free agent with the Seattle Seahawks, and, and I got to play in one game. And I got to lead the team out of the tunnel with the American flag before the game, which was a pretty incredible honor. And, uh, you know, I played the whole second half. I did great. Ended up getting cut the next week as it goes. But, you know, it, it's, it's all good. Like, that, that's, that's just the way it works. There's only one long snapper for every NFL team. And, you know, I had my shot. I did, I did the best that I could. And, and I was grateful for that. But, but one quick thing. I know I'm out of time, and I'm sorry. But one quick thing I do want to share about that experience was actually before the game. Um, before the game, you know, in college, we're not on the field when the anthem is played. Uh, the, the, the players are still in the locker room. But in the NFL, as everybody knows, at this point at least, like, players are on the field. And uh, I'm standing out there, and this is 2015. I'm standing out there, the anthem starts playing, and I was kind of uh, uh, surprised. You know, like, I wasn't thinking about it. And I was like, oh, man, I got to find the tallest flag in the building, and I got to face the right way and put my hand on my heart, you know, and stand at attention and do the whole thing. And I do that. The song starts playing. I just started bawling, like just absolutely bawling. And uh, I was thinking about, you know, people, people in the military that were still overseas fighting, those that didn't make it back. Um, I was thinking about the kid that I was that had no confidence, you know, didn't believe in himself. And then where I was at now, because I just kept going and I just like let people inspire me and I let the world shaped me a bit and, and I just kind of put myself out there and I was proud of that and I, I am still proud of that. Um, you know, but also I was thinking about people that were in my shoes at that age or even younger or older that don't have that confidence and how, how much that, that sucks and what that feels like, you know, and I was just like, man, hopefully this inspires somebody. Hopefully this helps somebody find their why or their purpose. Fast forward a year later, um, and Colin Kaepernick starts sitting on the bench during the anthem. And, you know, it's obviously a very debatable topic. Um, it's in the middle of the election cycle between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton when this was going on. And, uh, you know, Colin was sitting on the bench during the anthem, uh, and it was like national news. And all of a sudden, I'm getting hit up from Fox News and from CNN and MSNBC, and they're all like, weigh in on this. Come on our show and debate it. And I was like, man, I, I don't want to debate this. It's, it's not my... It's not my fight, first of all. And second of all, like, how is that going to help anything? Um, I ended up writing an open letter to the Army Times, uh, well, to Colin Kaepernick through the Army Times, just explaining why it means so much to me, but also, you know, trying to listen as well and trying to be open-minded because I think we live in a time where that's unfortunately pretty rare, you know, and it's not popular, and those people don't often get a microphone. Um, and so I wrote that letter saying, hey, this is why I'll always stand. This is the, why I feel the way I feel. But at the end of the day, I took the oath to defend the Constitution, which includes the First Amendment. And, uh, you know, it's your right. I fight for your right to do what you're doing. I might not agree with it, but, I, but I'll fight for that. I'll die for that. And, uh, and a lot of people read it. Obviously, mixed reviews on that. Um, but, uh, but Colin read it. And Colin ended up reaching out to me, and he wanted to meet. So we met the next day down in San Diego before the final preseason game that year. And we had a conversation at, on game day in, in the team hotel. And uh, it was an hour and a half of, of, you know, two guys that knew nothing about each other, really, um, that ended up having an awful lot in common and some very distinct differences as well. And that's OK. Uh, but two people that could have, you know, uh, a, a conversation and genuinely listen to one another. At the end of the conversation, Colin asked, you think there's another way I could protest that won't offend people in the military? And I said, no. I said, there's, there's, there's nothing, there's no protest that's not going to offend somebody. I mean, that's kind of the intention of it anyway. I mean, protests are meant to make people, uh, or, or, or to, to uh, they're not meant to be comfortable. Let's just put it that way. You know, that's, that's kind of the point. Um, and I said, you know, f for me, sit, seeing you sit on the bench by yourself, kind of isolated away from everybody, it, to me, that's just my opinion, it, it's not the most inspiring thing in the world. Um, but I understand why you're doing what you're doing, you know. 
uh, and what the fight you're trying to make. You want you ultimately, I think you you want this place to be better. You want us to be accountable as a country um, for everybody, and you want everyone to feel uh, like they are equal, you know, and, and and strive towards that. And I'm I'm for that if it's you know if it's done in a manner that is respectful and you know and and you're willing to listen to both sides of an argument and he was and uh I, and i said if you're asking my opinion man this is just me i think being alongside your teammates is the most important thing i mean you're about to go shoulder to shoulder with those guys out there on the field um if there's any way you you, you know you could be alongside them i think that would be the way to go and he said well i'm not going to stand I, i've committed to that and i said well what if you what if you took a knee what if you took a knee alongside your teammates you know at least it's half mast or, or something like that. And, you know, seriously, I mean, in retrospect, maybe not the smartest thing to say on a quick snap decision because obviously he did it and, uh, and it's become quite a contentious thing. But as I look back on it now, I mean, there's nothing I would, I would change in that conversation. I'm glad I said what I said. I spoke my truth. I, I mean, I was as honest as I thought I could be. And he asked my opinion. I gave him my opinion, and then he made a decision. And, uh, and I respect that. I stood next to him that day when he took a knee. And uh, the most offensive thing about that to me was the booing that I heard in the stadium during the anthem, you know. Um, that broke my heart more than anything. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it's not, a, it, it's not something that will, will just kind of go away. It's a conversation that will probably continue for quite some time. But um, I think at the end of the day what's most important for me is that you know, we just respect one another. We love one another. Um, when I think about purpose and my why, like, I had the conversation with somebody about this lately, recently. And, like, being able to define, like, what's your purpose, at least for me, is impossible. I don't know. Because it keeps changing, at least what, what people define as a purpose today. Like, I think I have a lot of different passions. Um, but I think my purpose is just to love, you know? And to try to and to be able to accept it from other people and feel like I'm worth it, you know, because I, I know I struggle with that. I know a lot of people in this community struggle with that. Um, I think people in the world struggle with that genuinely, feeling like you're not enough and you're not you're not worth it. You don't deserve it. Um, so for me, like that's my purpose. It's just love. My passions will always change and adjust. And as soon as I, you know, I make uh, as soon as I conquer some challenge. Like, I got to find the next one. Go Ruck knows all about that. Like, you got to find the next challenge. Like, what is the next thing? Let's make it harder. Let's turn it up a notch. Let's go. Let's find something else. So, like, that will never change. But, you know, I think my why, it has to be, it has to be love. And that's me. Um, I'm Nate Boyer. Sorry for going over on time. But thank you guys so much for listening. Really appreciate it. And God bless America. Thanks.